Uh, I'd like to now bring in Michael Bosa Q. He is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and he joins me now live from Lviv in Ukraine. Michael, really good to have you with us um, and, and thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, you're, you're in Ukraine right now, you're in Lviv. We know that it has reached full capacity according to the mayor. He says that he needs more help. At the same time, you're seeing, you know, pleas from Volodymyr Zelensky on Facebook and now to the British Parliament. What do you make of the calls for more assistance? And do you think that the West has been doing enough? Yeah, good to be with you. Um, well, President Zelensky is echoing very eloquently, very eloquently uh, with every speech he gives, what the average Ukrainian is thinking. I mean, just before coming on with you, I was talking to young Ukrainians and, um, you know, you can say to them as much as you want, oh, the, you know, the UK is going to allow you to come there and give you visas and work permits and so on. And they say, we don't want that right now. We want the war to stop. And most importantly, we want to stay in our homeland. Um, you know, uh, it's also uh, quite extraordinary when Zelensky speaks like that. He drew a very horrific timeline, and I think he's become very adept at um, uh, waking up uh, Western audiences to what is going on here. I've uh, I covered his election. I profiled him a few times for CNN Opinion, and he's really grown into a wartime president. But the most important thing, again, to emphasize is this isn't a politician speaking any longer. This is a man who feels the pain of his own people. He cited the number of kids that have been dying. Um, you know, speak to any Ukrainian and they will also tell you, we will fight to the end. But they also say, why is it that we are putting our lives, our kids' lives onto the line for basically the security of Europe? And I've been hearing Zelensky say that a lot more is that this should not be seen only as Ukraine's war, but the but the West war. And one more quick thing, if I may, I think the realization here is that the no-fly zone is not going to happen. It's just not politically uh, viable uh, in terms of Western eyes. But uh, there are alternatives that, for example, do you think it should happen, Michael? Do you, do you, do now, you think that well, the no-fly uh, zone it, should yeah. be something that should be considered, or do you think it's going to cause a bigger escalation? Because that's the fear. Yeah. Um, it would help a lot to the Ukrainian armed forces who don't have uh, the same capability, of course, in the air. But yeah, it would cause an escalation. But having said that, I mean, anything uh, the West says it's going to do, for example, the sanctions, Mr. Putin fires back, well, this is a declaration of war and, you know, you better be careful. And I have to say, um, he's becoming, I think, increasingly unstable. And yesterday on CNN Newsroom, you, you know, you had General Wesley Clark saying that, his big worry is that with the, Mr. Putin becoming more anxious at the lack of battlefield progress, that he may reach for a nuclear weapon. That is a very scary prospect, of course, and something all of the West should be paying attention to. It's a very complicated situation. But quickly, there are quick fixes to the humanitarian situation. For example, an air bridge between European capitals and Lviv that could bring humanitarian aid in quicker and more efficiently. Uh, Michael, we, you know, I was, I was, I've been listening to so many analysts and, poly, you know, you know, uh, historians and saying that it yeah. shows, uh, you know, t in terms of uh, Putin's playbook, that Russia is willing to throw any resource at this, including using as many soldiers as required. And he seems like yeah. someone that's not going to worry about the death toll. And that's the risk that is he could be in this for the long term, the long game. In the meantime, he's given clear direction in terms of what he wants. He wants Ukraine to be declared as an independent state and not join any bloc. If he gets those yeah. three demands, do you think that he will withdraw? Is that even a possibility? Um, well, Scott was just talking about how they're not respecting humanitarian corridors. And if you can't, you know, uh, respect, you know, a relatively simple thing to implement like that, I don't know how you could be trusted. So, yes, they are. Um, what they're doing is they're laying down preconditions that no Ukrainian president could ever agree to recognizing uh, Crimea as part of Russia, Donetsk and Luhansk, not joining NATO. Um, and also, uh, we are told that um, Mr. Putin wants to install a puppet prime minister should Mr. Zelensky stay in power. So these are all preconditions that are no non-starters. And um, it's very tough to, to find a way out of this because of that. But I, again, I can't emphasize over enough that 
He cannot be trusted to hold these promises, and the West has to find other solutions, maybe put more leverage on China. You know, they've, they've been in this increasing bromance over the past uh, years, and China, I think, is watching this very carefully. But I think there's leverage left with them to put pressure on, on Putin. Yeah, Michael, Michael, we've run out of time, but very quickly, where are you? Are you safe, and how are you doing? Thank you for asking. I'm in Lviv. Um, I am safe. Um, and, uh, as they mentioned earlier, it is becoming a bit overwhelmed, but it's almost a split screen here, uh, to be honest with you, of the calm and all the people here and restaurants, cafes open. But the big fear, of course, is that um, they will not leave Lviv untouched. This is the birthplace of Ukrainian nationalism, after all, UNESCO heritage site. Uh, we have to be very careful and you know, that could that could that is a yeah. very real possibility, it's sad to say. Yeah. Michael, stay safe and we'll be touching base with you very soon. Thank you very much for your analysis. Thank you very much. And we'll be